Okay, 25 minutes. So this will be a lightning tour then. Um, topic here is overcoming technical debt when moving to heterogeneous architecture. That means what, hap what, what are some of the common issues that you're going to encounter when you start to add some ARM64 to your existing x86 cloud infrastructure? Um, well, first question is why would you even bother to do that? Right? Why would you try, why would you put yourself through all of the pain of adding a second hardware platform? Well, I'm hoping to convince you. Um, this is going to be a little, it's not a sales pitch, but it's going to be a little bit um, less deep. I, I, um, let, me, let me just put it this way. Um, there is a philosophy difference between what the ARM64 servers are doing and what traditional x86 servers are doing. Um, the first is we, we call ourselves Ampere Computing, we call ourselves a cloud native CPU. And what we mean by that is that it's built from the ground up for the needs of the cloud. Uh, so what, what does that mean? Well, we focus on single-threaded cores, uh, all fa very fast cores, right? They, these are 2.6 to 3 gigahertz. This is not slow uh, cores, but single-threaded cores designed from the ground up for cloud-native workloads, right? Lots of cores per socket. Um, and that matters because the industry continues to evaluate CPUs based on how fast a single core can go. That's what all the benchmarking tools evaluate, right? And yet, uh, when you're deploying a cloud application to, uh, to a cloud native environment, when you're deploying a microservice application, you don't actually usually care how fast an individual core is. As long as it's fast enough, um, what you actually care about is, is how the, the workload does, uh, how the workload behaves across a large number of cores. So basically, our argument is that the future needs of the cloud will be more cores, less power, more cores per rack. So in a, in a 42U rack, instead of having, uh, say, 18 or 20 servers, because you've got to leave extra space for cooling, for airflow, uh, you're, going to have, you're going to have the ability to go up to 38 servers plus a top rack switch. Um, which means it's good for your pocket, right? More CPU cores, if we're selling a CPU with more CPU cores and less volume, less power needs, that means the capital expenditure and operating expenditure uh, for the cloud services go down and therefore lower operating expenditure means that they can charge less per core hour uh, to you as a consumer. Um, whether they do or not is, is uh, another question, but they certainly have the ability. And, and we've seen in our CSP customers that their, uh, their competitive pricing for ARM64 cores, and even more competitive when you think about, and we'll get to that a little bit later, when you think about um, price performance for a given SLA for your application. Finally, it's good for the planet, right? This is something that my colleague Aaron talked about yesterday. Uh, about 3% of energy production now uh, goes to the cloud, and that's trending to, I really need to fix this typo, trending to 10% by 2033, um, according to one report that I read. Um, and why does that matter? Well, it's kind of abstract. Right? Like One of the things that I found is cloud developers don't really think about the CO2 burden of their applications. right? But we're in a world now where there are zoning decisions that are being made around housing versus data centers in a, a lot of European cities, um, London, Amsterdam, Frankfurt, um, because of the demand that data centers put on the electricity grid. So in that world, we, we, we do really need to start asking ourselves, you know, this is a real estate question. This is a quality of life question for people who are living in these cities. Um, do we want more data centers or more housing for people? Okay, so I hope I've convinced you that it's worth looking at, but now the question is, well, how do you do it? Um, and I'd say there's roughly a playbook that goes like this. It's, it's you find out about the platform, uh, you evaluate it for your workload, then you do your build, your test and optimize, make sure that your, uh, your price performance and your performance profile is acceptable, and then move to deployment into production. Um, so I'm going to focus most of this on, on what kind of... Uh, issues you can hit be between build and deploy. But um, basically, the starting point is when you're assessing uh, is 
look at what software, software you're running. Um, most modern operating system distributions, uh, I mean, most cloud applications are on Linux, mo most modern Linux distributions support ARM64 out of the box as a tier one platform. Um, because ARM64 is relatively new in the industry, like five years, you're probably going to get a faster uh, experience with newer distributions like an Ubuntu 22.04 or a Red Hat 9 than you are with, uh, with older versions like a, an Ubuntu 16.04 or a Red Hat 7. Um, so all of the community built distributions um, also typically support x86, uh, x86 and ARM64. Uh, and you certainly have your choice of commercial support if you want it. And then in compilers and runtimes, again, we've got that, uh, that, um, that kind of need to go to newer runtimes. Uh, Java is one which <laughs> I'll get into a little bit later, but um, um, there is so much Java 8 out there. How many people here have Java applications running on their infrastructure? And is it Java 8? <laughs> OK, Java 8 is like 11, 12 years old. Um, so a lot of the performance uh, improvements that have gone into the JVM have gone in between Java 14, Java 17, and even into Java 21 now. Uh, so you will get nothing by, by nothing but moving the JVM from Java 8 to Java 17. Uh, you get a 30% speed up for uh, Java applications on ARM64, which is kind of wild. But uh, obviously, ARM64, and I know everybody in this room knows this, ARM64 is a different architecture to x86. So you're going to need to recompile. Anything that's compiled code needs to be compiled to that architecture. Uh, for um, applications like Java, uh, Python that compile to, to um, or, uh, Java or .NET that compile to intermediate language, or Python that's an interpreted language, you can just run your code. All of these runtimes, you know, they're fully supported on ARM, and uh, as long as you stay in the mainstream, you're probably not going to have any issues. Um, and then you got to think about what applications to run. So I will say one of the really, really key differentiators between ARM CPUs in the cloud and x86 CPUs in the cloud is the tail latencies that you will see on anything that's latency uh, dependent, right? Video transcoding or voice or caching, for example, in-memory caching are the types of applications where you see a massive improvement, not necessarily because of the performance of the course, but because those applications, uh, you care more about the worst performance than you do about the mean performance, right? Uh, so for example, if you're running in a, a, an object cache as a service, you care about the experience that uh, the slowest uh, response will give a customer, right? You want to make sure that your tail latencies are as predictable as possible. And so one of, the, one of the things that you see in, in the ARM64 architecture is that, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, is that um, you get linear scalar, scaling under load. So you can change your auto-scaling algorithm to, instead of scaling, uh, adding new nodes at 65% or 60% load, you can go all the way up to 90% load before you add new nodes. Okay, but in general, um, the general rule of thumb is applications written with uh, modern, modern, modern languages um, that are cloud-native scale-out workloads are going to be a super good fit for this platform. Okay, so I said this already. All binaries that you're going to run are going to need to be compiled for ARM64 natively or cross-compiled. Uh, so what does that look like? Uh, so let's take one example. Uh, it's going to depend on a variety of factors, the size of your application, the programming language you're using, and how much architecture-specific optimization your uh, is in your code. But if you look at something like Postgres, it is a single line, right? You add a minus M CPU native, and then uh, you build it. The make file, it's going to work out of the box. Um, that's not the typical experience. But you can certainly find a lot more uh, uh, transition and building guides on the, the Ampere Computing Developer site. But let's look at some of the gotchas, some of the things that, uh, that can come through that do make a difference when you're building. There are issues that will be revealed by the architecture change. And this is what I've been calling in the title that 
it often falls into paying down technical debt. And we're going to go through some of the gotchas that you might find. Um, I've listed a few of them here, but I'll list them again later. Um, okay, first one, x86 specific C flags. Um, if you have minus M SSE2, for example, or uh, any of the other uh, x86 specific uh, SIMD uh, accelerators, right? That will not work on ARM64. Uh, you need to use the ARM64 equivalent, which requires recoding. Uh, but if you want to get it to work out of the box, you can just skip the SSE stuff and use the, the native CPU instead. Um, any C programmers here? Okay, what's and there's at least two or three issues with this uh, C code at the end. What's uh, yeah? Okay, so, okay. so get car returns an int. So what's going to happen uh, if you have this code on x86? going to be fine, right? Because a car is a signed uh, data type. It's a signed integer type on x86. However, on ARM64, a car is an unsigned data type. So this will never, uh, this will be a, uh, an infinite loop, right? So these are the kind of things that pass through compilation that you, you come up with later. Again, I would call this technical debt. OK, when you're doing cross compilation, uh, which is one way that people build their applications for ARM64. Uh, you have to really be careful of build caches. You can uh, find yourself linking with x86 objects. These are all going to come up at compile time. They're not going to be deploy time issues. Um, but you really need to make sure also that you're matching the versions of the run times uh, on the target platform and the compile time libraries that you're using on the build platform. Um, it's very, very common to have like uh, version mismatches between kind of the libc that you're compiling on and the libc that you're going to run on, uh, including, uh, well, I'll get to that later. Uh, again, ARM64 is still relatively new, uh, right? The Raspberry Pi 3 was the first 64-bit ARM processor and the Raspberry Pi, that was 2016. Uh, I think that was really the point at which you started to see ARM64 become widely supported by open source projects. Um, it entered into the server space in 2018 with Graviton 2. Uh, then you have uh, the Ampere Ultra uh, processor came out in May 20, 2020. That's what's deployed in Google, Microsoft, Oracle Cloud. And then the Mac M1, November, November 21. Uh, so what you've seen is uh, we've come into kind of general usage with Raspberry Pi, into the cloud with Graviton and Ampere, and into the desktop and high performance um, kind of personal computing with the Mac M1 and M2. Um, what it means is that a lot of the improvements that have gone in to accelerate the performance of very commonly used projects, both in the cloud and in the desktop, a lot of those improvements have gone in since then, which means you need to make sure you're using a relatively recent programming language, operating system, um, and if you're deploying, for example, to Kubernetes, uh, you're going to want to have a recent Kubernetes, Istio, and all the things. OK, let's look at some gotchas that you can find in performance. This is going back to what I was saying earlier. Um, all Ampere cores are real cores. There is no simultaneous multi-threading on uh, Ampere cores, which means that when you get a vCPU from a, a, a cloud service provider, you're actually getting a core you're actually getting a physical core. That has a big impact in terms of uh, both uh, resource isolation on layer, uh, level two and level one caches, uh, but also in terms of the scalability of the processor. Uh, we also don't have opportunistic turbo frequencies. Don't ask me what that means. I just know that it means that we basically always run at the same frequency instead of modulating it. I, here I'm outside my comfort zone. I'll just leave it at that. This, however, is uh, the reason why what I said earlier about changing your auto-scaling algorithm is going to be so important. Apps will scale to, to, to higher loads. What you're seeing here is resource contention on x86, right? If you have two applications that are both going above 50% load on uh, an x86 processor, you will see uh, degradation 
And this will show up as degradation in the tail latencies for anything that's latency specific. You're just getting a little bit longer of a wait because you've got two things that are in a line and there's contention for the resource. So in terms of gotchas, you're going to want to update your auto-scaling algorithm and think about application SLA, not per core performance, when you're thinking about moving to ARM64. You can do the same work with fewer cores because you don't have that resource contention per core. So assumptions about the performance of applications and the scaling behavior of applications are typically in, uh, in uh, cloud deployments are, are typically going to be based on a leg legacy view of the world, uh, a world in which we have that one vCPU is equal to half of a core, and therefore you have resource contention. Uh, so let's talk about the deployment phase. Uh, the first thing you're going to have to do is you're going to have to create multi-architecture containers for all of your code. Uh, so I'm guessing everybody here knows what a multi-architecture container is, but can I have a show of hands? OK, almost everyone. So a multi-architecture container is uh, basically you build an x86 container, you build an ARM container, you put both of those on your on your container registry, and then you create a manifest which says if the, the container being requested is being requested on an x86 node, pull the x86 container. If it's being requested on ARM, pull the ARM container. And that manifest is then uh, what is labeled with the general tag, whether that's a version or latest or whatever. Um, so why is this important? Uh, well. Um, it means that you can have the same, exact, exactly the same code for pulling the, the, the container on your x86 and on your, on your ARM nodes. Uh, so this is going to require uh, updating your infrastructure's code tools and uh, all of your deployment pipelines to make sure that you're building your, your containers appropriately. Um, voila. Uh, the gotcha here is, <laughs> this, is a, this is kind of a silly one. Um, there is no standard across different hosts for what uname minus m gives you in terms of the architecture. Uh, so you will see ARC64, ARM64, AMD64, x86-64, and x86-64, and it's going to be up to you to normalize to make sure that you get to the Go Arch um, standard, which is AMD64 and ARM64. Um, so that's up to you. Also, very, very common problem is uh, if you have anybody who can build containers and can upload those containers to your, um, uh, your registry, at some point they will build an x86 container and overwrite your manifest. And what that means, <laughs> has that happened to you? Yes. What that means is that if somebody on an ARM64 host pulls the container, uh, well, it'll say there's no, uh, no, there, what, what, I, I, I'm hesitating between it'll say there's no ARM64 container uh, or that it'll try to pull the ARM container and run it and say, you know, incompatible ELF format. I can't say that was a while back, but okay. it was a fun to figure out that it was that because as you showed before, when you showed the details of it, differentiating the AMD64 and the ARM64 in that order. Uh, yeah, you're going to laugh a little bit later. Uh, okay, so more than once Docker pull uh, fails because containers are given a tag that's an x86 container instead of a manifest. Okay, infrastructure as code, however, is mostly going to be straightforward. Most of the infrastructure as code tools are already multi-architecture. Uh, the main change you're going to have to do is to update your instance types and avoid any hard-coded either paths to binary files or um, like things that include an architecture tag. Uh, Avoid that in your, in your infrastructure and co as code in your golden. OK, so let's look at what's involved if you want to run um, a container application on Kubernetes. Uh, what's involved in adding an ARM64 uh, node pool to an existing Kubernetes cluster and moving part of the application? Because this is one of the things that uh, it's important to know. It's not an all or nothing proposition. You can move part of an application to ARM64 and leave the rest of your application on x86. OK, so. WordPress, everybody's favorite application. Some, somebody, somebody called it poison, the poison of cloud native applications because, I don't know. 
recently. But I, 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 think, I think WordPress is a fine application. It scales really well. Anyway, uh, so we're going to start with uh, this is this. Basically, this is a demo tutorial that you can see at the bottom here. Uh, if you want to go along uh, and follow along, what we've got is a WordPress, WordPress application using file storage, uh, MySQL that's backed onto block storage. Um, we've got uh, uh, primary and replica on the MySQLs. And then there's a, there's a load balancer. So you can have multiple uh, application nodes if you want. There's going to be just one in the demo. So this is the Bitnami Helm chart for WordPress. It's nothing complicated. OK, so the first thing you're going to want to do is you're going to want to go, this is on OCI. You're going to want to go into, and it's, there is no norm across different uh, CSPs. You want to, you're going to want to go into the uh, Kubernetes, um, either do this with the command line with, uh, for the CSP, or go into the dashboard and add uh, you, you need to create an ARM64 node pool and add it to an existing Kubernetes cluster. And then there's uh, the technique, the, the ARM64 primitives you're going to use are taints and tolerances. Five minutes left. I'm nearly there. Uh, so you say basically um, uh, don't run this container on this type of node or run this container on this type of node and uh, by or you can say this container likes to run on this type of node with an infinity, and I think that's what we used. Uh, so you've got a, a Helm chart, you update it. Uh, so what we've done here is the um, MySQL database. Uh, we say, okay, let's, this has a, a hard affinity for, uh, oh, and look what you were saying, AMD64, ARM64, so it can run on either. What that does, in practice, is it runs one of the databases, the primary, I think, on AMD64, the replica on ARM64. And then we update the Helm chart again, and we run it again, and we say, OK, just remove the AMD64. The ARM64 becomes the primary. And, um, and all of a sudden, we've got our uh, MySQL is running on ARM64. And, oh, and then we can update the uh, Helm chart again and say, OK, now we're going to add a replica, but it's only going to use the ARM64. Uh, so you've, you've um, You've basically, with uh, modifying a Helm chart, running it a couple of times, you've moved your MySQL database. You have to give the, the replica process a little time to, to complete. But you've moved your MySQL database onto ARM64. So now you've got WordPress with part of your application running on one platform and part of your application running on another. Uh, gotchas, uh, sidecars. So if you use any sidecar containers, you're going to need, make sure that they are also uh, multi-arch. Um, otherwise, you're going to be messed up. Uh, so remember, all containers deployed on ARM64 nodes must be ARM64 containers. Um, if you are building, the, this is not going to be a problem for uh, things like Envoy. Uh, but if you use a lot of sidecars, you're going to want to make sure that you uh, avoid this. And, uh, sir? Um, I'm not speaking from, from experience, but AMD64 and ARM64 do look very similar. So you need to make sure that if, that, you know, <laughs> that, might, that might be the problem. Okay, so I'm going to summarize. Uh, I, I kind of flew through this, uh, but um, our playbook for transitioning to Ampere Ultra, ARM-based compute. Uh, Ampere is the processor for ARM instances on GCP, on Azure, on OCI, um, we're available as bare metal instances and Equinix and Hetzner, and that's about the, the end of my sales pitch. Um, we have lots of information on our website where you can learn about the Ampere processor and deploying applications on it. Um, start by doing an assessment of your software stacks. Make sure that if you've got a lot of uh, machine code in C, that's probably not a good, choice, good place to start. But if you've got an app, a Java application, oh, I forgot about my Java thing. Um, Java 8. So this is, this is one of the things that made Adam Jacob go, oh, why wouldn't anyone do that? Uh, OK. Um, if you're running Java, Java 8 and you have to absolutely stay on Java 8, there is an option that will put the Java 17 JVM under a Java 8 JRE and fix all the plumbing. Uh, it's called the uh, Enterprise uh, Performance Pack from Oracle. Uh, so you can get Java 17 per level performance with Java applications that are Java 8 applications. If you're stuck for some reason, 
I mean, I don't know why anyone would do that rather than pay down the technical debt and move to Java 17 or 21, but uh, if, if you choose to do that, then, um, then that is an option. Uh, in your build chain, you are going to have to add ARM64 runners to any CI that you're using. That's a, a pretty straightforward and manual step. If you're using, ARM, if you're using GitHub uh, Actions, uh, you can run self-hosted runners and it's, it works fine for private repos. You're, it's not advised for public repos um, just because people can clone your repo and, and run arbitrary code on your, on your runners. Um, uh, ARM, ARM64 container images are readily available for most open source applications that you're going to come across in your cloud application. And there is a little bit of work to do to test and optimize to make sure that you're getting the right settings. And like I said, auto, auto, um, auto scaling algorithm, um, uh, memory settings on Java and, and that kind of thing. But um, then you're mostly done. Uh, and I'm interested in hearing if any of you have a go and, uh, and, and, and do well or have any issues. I am interested in hearing stories. I love those stories. Um, and that's it. I'm done. <laughs>